testing. Hey there, how you doing, folks? God bless you. Where'd everybody go? <laughs> holiday weekend. And speaking of the holiday weekend, of course, it is it is Memorial Day tomorrow, and I want to encourage you to be honorable tomorrow. I don't understand where the where the draw or the connection of intoxication is to remembering our, our fallen dead, right? Am I by myself there? Am I by myself? <laughs> but don't, don't forget to remember those who died to make us free. I've had some, some friends of mine that, um, that followed a different faith when it came to their, their beliefs, and, and they, they're against you know, the military, and, and uh, I just don't understand that because there's men and women who have died for our freedom and our liberty, and I appreciate them. But there's someone I appreciate even more, and that is Jesus Christ, who died for my eternal liberty, not just a temporary one. So let's remember those who have fallen and the biggest one, which is Jesus Christ, who died for you and me when we didn't know who he was. When we were still on our sinners, Christ died for us. So I appreciate his sacrifice. So I want to encourage you to have a good time tomorrow and uh, and uh, whatever you're going to do, but please be careful uh, while you're celebrating. Um, I want to give a quick uh, warning that today, if you have a ministry moment, I want to give you time to think about it. So we will be giving a time for that uh, in a little bit. So if you have a ministry moment, if God's done something or you've seen him move uh, this week or in the last couple of weeks, please let let us know and tell us because in so doing, we encourage each other in the Lord. So I want to encourage you to do that. Are we going to have to announce it? Do we still have any, have any updates on, on our fundraiser? Susan? <coughs> we still made 100, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Over 100,000. Awesome. Food deliveries today. So immediately after service, if you could help us with that. Uh, we will go and help some people and love them, and let them feel and and experience the love of Christ through us. Anyone else? All right. I, well, hey, before I just want to say this about the confirmands last week. What a what an excellent job uh, they did, and I just want to thank them for their diligence, their hard work, and um, and their courage to get up here and do what they did last week. So, salute to all our confirmands. Would you stand with me, please? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. That's why we're here, to demonstrate that love by coming and worshiping with other believers. And Father, I pray that everything that we hear and experience today, everything we do and participate in, that you'll be glorified, Father, that you'll be lifted up. We are here for you. And Father, I pray that as we worship you in spirit and truth, you will feel our warmth our love, our respect, our adoration. So we put you first today and love you in all things. In Jesus' name, all of God's children say with me, Amen. Amen. Remain standing. Let's sing, Brother Paul. <coughs> mm -hmm. Let's sing, We Will Glorify. <coughs> we will glorify the King of Kings we will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords. Who is the great I am? Today is found in multiple parts of the Bible. 
The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To which the law and the prophets testify. Righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no difference, for all have sinned of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His justice at the present time. And the one who justifies is faith him. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of grace that he lavished on us by the wisdom of God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free, from the sins committed under the first covenant. For you know that it was not to that the children of God received you. It's the precious blood of Christ, the Lamb without blemish. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. My faith and my hope are in God. This is the word of God, and it is true and dependable. Brother Paul? Amen. Let's sing this beautiful song. There's something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Let's sing it once more. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Bow your heads with me, please, and let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you that there is power in the name of the Son of God, that no matter where we are, what we face, what is coming to us, that we have power over those problems and circumstances. So, Father, we call upon the name of Jesus to heal, to save, to deliver, and to provide. We thank you so much, Lord, for being who you are, and we rejoice in you today that when the world is 
floundering without hope. We have hope in you. We love you, Father. We call your name to our lives today. Take complete control. Abide with us and comfort us, Lord. In Jesus' name, we love you so much. Amen and amen. Amen. You may be seated. Ushers, if you would please take your places. We will receive our tithes and offerings today. Let's, let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we love you and thank you for the opportunity we have to bring our tithes to the storehouse, to give cheerfully and liberally, God. We ask, God, that you bless the gift and the giver. I pray, Father, that you would prosper us according to your good grace and your kindness as we touch other people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Give us a little lift. How are y'all doing? Still being okay? Oh, oh, no, not you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Not you. You stay with me, okay? I'm going to give you something in just a minute. We want to pray over you, okay, and ask God to bless you, to keep you, and to protect you. Did you know even if we didn't do this, God himself would still do this? Even if we forgot, the Lord loves you, and he will never forget you. He will never leave you, and he will never forsake you. He has a plan for your life, and he has set that up, and he wants you to follow him and to trust him. And that's why we're doing what we're doing, because we do. And we want to ask God to bless you and touch you. So, Ron, if you please come ahead. And congregation, would you please stand? Let's speak the blessing over these excellent young people as they pray together. As parents and as guardians. Super. God bless you and your mom. Thank you. God bless you. For you and your life. God bless you in Jesus' name. May the Lord protect you and to keep you in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you protect and keep you. May God bless you and protect you in the name of Jesus. May the Lord be with you and protect you in the name of Jesus. Wherever you go, we as parents and guardians understand that children are a heritage from the Lord and we will treat you as such. May God bless you and keep you, our precious children, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let me give you guys something. VBS is coming up. You may be seated, congregation. VBS is coming up soon. There we go. Got the good stuff there. And uh, we got some fun things for you. Fun stuff. Yes, Judy. You have to go to Miss Linda, right? Yeah. Can I just say this? Hold up, hold up. That means I've started it, and he'll start as soon as he can. <laughs> But it's about um, it's about the generation that is uh, even. Hey, y'all, hang on just a second. I want us to pray one more thing, Cameron. Can we pray one more thing for you? 
This is the um, current generation that is, well, even Generation Xers, um, that have been sorely affected by the technology age and by all of the screens and everything and, and to the point of anxiety and mental illness. And um, this book is just really rattling my cage. Um, and I would like for you, if we could, could we add to our blessing today protection over our children for the 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 increase in information, the increase. Information is a wonderful thing. I, I'm a Google queen. But there's a point where we have to have wisdom as parents and grandparents as far as our screens and our children. And it's affecting them in ways that we really um, didn't know how to pr predict. And some of you did. And <laughs> But could we stand and just ask for God to give us all mm. wisdom, parents, grandparents, and mm. ask protection over our children for, from anxiety and from the things that the pressures in the modern age that we live in, what they are bringing on our children that we really need to have wisdom about so that we can protect them. It's our job to protect them. So let's ask the Lord to bless them and protect them and to give us wisdom and to know how, okay? Mm. Lord, we just lift up our children before you. And we lift up ourselves. We ask for you to give us wisdom to touch the parents of our children. Mm. And we just plead the blood of Jesus over their minds yes. and over their emotions and over their wills. And we just ask, Father, in Jesus' name that you would just cover them and protect them, Lord, from, yes. the, from the negative influences of our technology age. And that you would give the parents, grandparents, mm. and teachers, administrators, give us all wisdom, Lord, in how to proceed and how to protect we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we've got one more. Thank you. We have had a lot going on as far as needs in our church. There's been a lot of things and a lot of people who need prayer this morning. Who, who would you like to lift up uh, by name this morning? I know there's a lot that we're praying for that. Yes, ma'am. Him, um, Kim's stepfather went to be with the Lord this week. His name is Walt, and so um, we need to pray for her mom and, and Kim and her family. Um, are, are there other prayer requests this morning? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's pray for her health. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> and you're uh, live, uh, just a little example of an answer to our prayers. So thank you, Lord. <laughs> oh, all right. Yes, ma'am. All right, off to Washington, D.C. That's awesome. We really will. Yes, sir? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Jason. Yes, sir? Yes. Anyone else? Would you stand with me? Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, thank you so much for answering our prayers for Lily Mae. Thank you for touching her uh, surgery with her pacemaker and that she's with us today. We just ask that you continue to strengthen her and to bring her back to full speed, Lord, and just give her good health and good days. 
Father, we just ask, Lord, that you would touch Kim Idlewine's family. Please minister to them, Lord, at the loss of Walt. Please touch her mom and all those who love him. Please give them strength and comfort. And, Lord, we just pray that they would cling to you and to just trust you, Lord, with all their hearts. <clears throat> Please touch Winifred's servant. Minister to her body, Lord. We just ask for you to heal her back and heal her completely, Lord, of all the things that she needs from you. We just ask, Lord, for you to just bring her back to to full just to full enjoyment, Lord, and full ability to move and to just enjoy her life, Lord. Please touch Lillian Kostick much the same way. Please give her strength and help her, Lord, to trust you. And we just ask for you to minister to she and Tom at this time in their lives and help them, Father, to just completely lean on you. And we ask for you to just restore strength to them, Lord, in their body. Please touch Kyle and, and Cameron, Lord. We just ask that you touch them as they... Uh, I'm sorry, Cooper, and touch them as they go to Washington, D.C. Give them um, safety as they go and just bless their time together and touch this trip that they're making, Lord. Please touch Jason and heal him, Father, as he heals from this wreck. Please touch him and help him to know that you're going to take care of everything financially and everything that he needs for his family, Lord, that you will take care of. I pray, Lord, that you would just move on the hearts of your people to show him your love, Lord, and to minister to him and to his needs. In Jesus' name, please touch Samir Allah Amar, Lord. We just ask for you to know his heart, know his needs. We ask for wisdom. We ask, Father, that you would touch him and that you would just um, be his Lord and Savior, change his life, and minister to every need that he has, Father. We ask, Lord, that you would touch William Thornton. We pray, Father, the church today joins with the, with the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, we say, come home, William. Come home to Jesus. Come home in Jesus' name. And come and know your Lord and Savior. And come and join your, your creator. Come and join the master who loves you. And, Father, we just, we just say, come home to William right now in Jesus' name. And we ask for his soul. We ask for him to love you and serve you and walk with you all the days of his life, Lord, that are remaining. We ask this in your precious name, Lord. And now we pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have a ministry note, as I gave you a warning earlier, anyone have something you'd like to share that you've seen God do or he's used you in in certain ways. Anyone? What is Come on, Brad. Yeah. Sometimes you get ideas in this of other ways to represent the Lord and things to do. And uh, so I, I often listen very carefully to what you guys have to say because any new way that I have to share the Lord, I want to know about it. So. Hi, guys. Hey. <laughs> You know, I'm not perfect by any means. I'm a sinner just like the rest of us. But you guys have got me into a habit when I go out and eat somewhere, you know, I talk to the waiter or waitress. Well, one day last week, I was eating breakfast at IHOP <laughs> over in Bryan. And, uh, you know, normally I go in there, and I go in there once or twice a week because we're working on that side of town over there. And usually it's a, you know, a little young girl, college kid or something like that, and I had no problem. Well, this day, I got a, an elderly gentleman. He's my age. And I sat there and come over and brought me my coffee, and I said, well, do I really want to ask this guy? You know, and come over there and brought me my breakfast, and I almost didn't do it, but I said, hey, what's your name? His name is James. And I told him, you know, I say bless when I give blessings for my uh, 
food if there's anything I could in particular I could pray about for him. And he looked at me and he stopped and he thought and he said, uh, you know, my wife and my our best friend's wife, her name is Cindy. She's in the hospital with stage four cancer. So we prayed. And the whole time I, uh, the whole time I was there, he just kept coming back and we talked a little bit and I mean, it's just little things, little things like that. <laughs> you have no idea the impact you can have on someone else's life. That's right. It's just just a simple word. That's right. And it just blew me away because I wasn't going to say anything because he was some dude my age. But anyway, that's okay. it. That's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Well done. Uh, that, that you mentioned that, Kim, because sometimes, depending on the person that's waiting on you, there seem to be different levels of, of hesitation. Am I the only one? And uh, I, I had that same thing to happen to me the other day. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, I'm by myself. And, and, and I, I battled. The enemy does not want you to represent the Lord. And when you do, it just reeks of confidence and leadership when you do something like that. And people need that. They need to find someone that really believes that this is real, what we do. And um, well done, Kim. Yeah. And, and, and chances are you'll reap rewards for that in heaven. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Ms. Lynn? Thank you, Kim. Um, I almost <laughs> forgot this. This is a, an announcement about um, Providence Baptist Church. They're celebrating 183 years, and that will be next Sunday, June the 2nd. Uh, it says for the date, and of course, they have uh, typical services. At 145, uh, they have a gospel concert by the Book Quartet if you're interested. I'm going to leave this up here in the shadow. If you like more information, there it is to celebrate uh, their, their wonderful anniversary. All right. Um, I think we're ready to go. Yeah. Ready to, to minister today. And, and today's message is actually the first part of, of a series that I'm going to be doing. Oh, VBS next week. That's what, that was the other thing I want to say. VBS is coming up. I know that many of you have already volunteered, and we want to thank you for that. This is going to be a challenge in here, and uh, there will be no quiet time in the sanctuary because someone will always be here. So uh, setup will have to be going on while kids are doing things. It's going to be a, a, a particular challenge, but I want to thank you in advance for being a part and helping us with that. The Lord bless you, okay? It's going to be a good, good week that we're going to have with VBS. I believe, if I'm correct, that we're going to have on Thursday evening, I think it's Thursday, uh, Robert and Christine, you guys got a snow cone truck. Is that correct? Yes. We have a snow cone truck coming for the kids. Last year we did an ice cream truck, and uh, this is going to be great. I can't. I'm really looking forward to the snow cone truck. All right, I'm sure they've got some good sugar-free flavors. You know, <laughs> but anyway, it's going to be be a great, great time. Uh, I think our three granddaughters will be here. They always love coming to VBS, and let's 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 be praying this week that God's going to change some children's lives forever. I believe that many VBSs were the catalyst in my life and in Rhonda's life uh, where we were taught the gospel and participated, and the Lord changed our lives through that. And who knows what God's going to do through these children, and we're going to be with them all week. So that'll be next week. All right. Let's begin this series that I've entitled Confusion in the Camp. I drop that pen every single week. It's just the devil, is it? Trying to distract you. This is called Confusion in the Camp, and I'm going to address some things uh, that have troubled me for years and years about people's understanding of what the Christian life is, uh, what the Bible says about it. And I want to, to deal with some things that a lot of people in the church are confused about. And this confusion can lead to problems. It can lead to uh, problems that will last your entire life. And let's begin by going in, in the Word. We're going to read from Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. And I want you to hear what happens here with 
Aaron's sons, these guys' names are Nadab and Abihu, and for years and years, I thought that their error, their problem, and the reason that they died before the Lord had to do with them rebelling against God. Many theologians, and I'm beginning to agree with that, is that it wasn't their open rebellion that caused them to die, but it was ignorance, it was carelessness that caused them to die before the Lord. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 11 says, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, they put fire in them, and added incense. So imagine these incense holders. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord. I believe King James says strange fire before the Lord. That was contrary to his commands. So God has set up things to be done in a certain way, in a certain time, to the Levites as they ministered. Nadab and Abihu were not civilians. They were Levites, called according to God's purpose to spend their lives in the service of the tabernacle and the temple. So these guys weren't amateurs. They knew what they were doing, but they did something wrong. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. What they were used to seeing was God's God's fire coming out from the presence of the Lord and consuming these sacrifices that they put. They didn't have the little match lighters to start the sacrifice. God would consume them with his presence and his fire. But this time, it consumes them and kills them. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. Aaron didn't get mad at God. He wasn't disappointed in God because Aaron knew his stuff. Aaron knew what they did was wrong. He knew exactly what was going on. He didn't cry out injustice, but he remained silent. Moses summoned Mishael and Elphazan, the sons of Aaron's uncle Uzael, and said to them, Come here, carry your cousins outside the camp, away from the front of the sanctuary. So they came and carried them, still in their tunics, outside the camp as Moses ordered. I think it's very interesting that they were still in their clothes. Now, you say, well, if they'd be consumed by fire, everything would be burnt to crisp. No, it wasn't. Just them. God didn't touch their tunics. He didn't touch their, their robes because their robes were consecrated to him. Their robes were holy. They were meant for God's service. And God just went to their bodies only and just killed them. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not let your hair become unkept, or do not tear your clothes. These were signs of mourning. Or you will die, and the Lord will be angry with the whole community. But your relatives, all the Israelites, may mourn for those the Lord has destroyed by fire. Do not leave the entrance to the tent of meeting, or you will die. Why? Because the Lord's anointing oil is on you. So they did as Moses said. See, things were still going in operation. They didn't change and modify anything because an emergency had taken place. They had the anointing oil of God on them, and they were not to leave the presence or the the entrance of the temple or the the, uh, tabernacle. So they did as Moses said. Then the Lord said to Aaron, You and your sons are not to drink wine or other fermented drink whenever you go into the tent of meeting, or you will die. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come so that you can distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean, and so you can teach the Israelites all the decrees the Lord has given them through Moses. A very critical juncture in the time of the service of the Lord. They were just learning what to do and how to do it. And God made very specific, it gave very specific instructions. If you read the book of Leviticus, what you learn through Leviticus, it's not monotonous and and hard to get through when you think of God knows exactly what he wants. There's people that that I know that know exactly what they want. You know any of them? They're not difficult. They just know what they want. God is more than that. God knows exactly what he wants, exactly what how he wants it. We don't get to modify, and and we need to understand something. God does not adjust to us. God will not adjust to me. I have to adjust to him. 
because he is holy, I am not. He is righteous, I am not. So it is my job, my duty to adjust my life, my lifestyle, my thoughts. Everything is to be transformed to God because he is the one that is perfect, not me. So here we have this story of Nadab and Abihu. And soon after what happens to them, a new decree, something comes up and says, it says, you and your sons are not to drink wine or other fermented drink whenever you go into the tent of meeting. And this is a lasting ordinance. Now, a lot of theologians have a lot of, of theories about what happened, and I, I tend to, to go with what they're saying, is that, that these two men very well may have drunk fermented drink or, or any, another type of alcoholic substance, and their judgment was aired. Their judgment slipped a little bit, and they began to get a little careless with what they were doing before the presence of God. He said, do it this way, and they did something to cause them to lose track of what they were doing and how they were doing it. We need to be careful what we tie ourselves with, to, whether it be from any drink or any other activity, any other thought process, because if it causes you to stray from what God has told you to do, it can cause us to err, and it causes us to get in trouble and can have lasting consequences on our lives. It's very important that, that we understand that God has a certain way he wants things done. He has a certain way that we should live because he's the one that created us. He's the one that did the DNA, the map of our entire bodies and everything. And he knows how we can get the best of what we are and who we are and how we were made. The insecurity level that's in, that's in America today and in the world where people don't think they're worth anything, they don't think that they can do anything, is because they're not doing things as God has designed them to do. I see people who don't have one ounce of musical talent. They just want to be a music musician. So they're, they're miserable all their lives because they can't sing, they can't play an instrument. Other people want to do other things. This person wants to do that, but God has designed each of us to do a certain thing. The head wants to be the hand, the hand wants to be the head, the foot wants to be the elbow, and the elbow wants to be the wrist. We need to say, God, what have you designed for me to do? What can I do to help you? What can I do for you to use me according to your will and your grace. Don't fight what God has created you to be. Be what God has created you to be. So whatever reason, Nadab and Abihu were confused, we need to up our spiritual awareness. We need to elevate our attributes spiritually so that we can have a, an awareness of what's going, a situational awareness of what's going on around us in the spiritual world. I was here, uh, was it? too late uh, one night, but I was going out to change the sign, and it was dark. The sign, you know, was dark, and, and it, it, you know, that black asphalt, and I'm walking across the parking lot, and I came upon this right here. Now, that wasn't my camera, but it was that snake. If you look at that, I thought, well, what is this? And I, I'm telling you, I, as, as I got about from here to the pew, that's when I saw him. And I had the letters and everything in my hands, and I was thinking about, see, and I saw this shape. And when I saw the shape, I thought, whoa. And I just stopped, and I backed up, and I assessed, I assessed the whole situation. I walked around it, trying to identify what kind of snake it was. It was doing what snakes do. In the evenings, you guys know this, they will go out onto asphalt or onto pavement of some type, and they will absorb the heat, right? They're cold-blooded animals. So in the evenings, if you want to find them, you can often find them on a road or in a, in a parking lot. And uh, I identified that snake as it, it, it was a copperhead. Now, that is not copper, but not all copperheads are the, are the color we're, we're used to. This was a dark one. I could see the pattern on his, on his body, and I said, that is a poisonous snake. And then the rest of the time, I thought, how am I going to kill this snake? And I, I will let go. Some of you would disagree with me, and that's fine. But I will let a snake go if it's non-poisonous because it kills rats. And rats are responsible for the black plague and all other kind of things. So I thought, okay. But this was a poisonous snake. And I, I was looking for something. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't kill him with my keys. And I wasn't going to shoot a gun at him out in the parking lot. you know. And I'm, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And I'm looking around. I'm looking for holes. I went back here. I looked for something. I looked, and that was too heavy. And I couldn't find anything. And, and I, I just thought, well, I'm just, you know, I went back to look at him, and he was gone. And then I had to go on over to the side <laughs> in the dark. Yeah, you're with me. You, you, see, you see it feeling this, aren't you? Had to go over there, and the whole time I'm changing the sign, I'm doing this here, you know. 
because I had no idea. You know, it was dark, it was black, and it was venomous. But I was aware of where it was. I was aware of its shape, and I spotted it because I had experience with finding snakes. Uh, recently, I was taking Nolan. Can you put Nolan up there right quick? Little Nolan, that's, that's our, our little white dog. And what he's doing right there, he's looking for squirrels. I said, Nolan, you need to go out and rest. And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes out there and hunts squirrels right there. But when he was even younger, I was in the backyard, and I was sort of walking out in the grass with him. And it was night. And um, my eyes picked up another shape. And sure enough, it was another copperhead that was in the grass. If he sees the copperhead, he has no experience with snakes. He doesn't know. And I thought he's going to run over there and he's going to get himself bit. Two of my dogs have been bit by copperheads in my yard in our, in our 19 years that I've been here. And I've taken them both. You know, we, we, we've ran them to, to a, 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 do, a, a veterinarian. And I remember the Texas A&M veterinarian, folks. They <laughs> I went over there and I, I, I got like a $350 Benadryl for, for uh, Tubby one time. Oh, there are other veterinarians there. <laughs> They're out there. But, uh, but anyway, I, I saw the snake before, before Nolan did, and I was able to, to dispatch the snake because I am aware of danger. We need to be aware of the things in this world that are dangerous to us. We need to have a situational awareness. I easily could have stepped on that snake, and if I'd have stepped on that snake, it would attack me. We've got to be careful of where we are, what's going on around us, and we need to know, we need to be able to, do, to distinguish and know the difference. We need to be able to avoid deadly confusion in our lives. Often we pray for a group of people we call the confused. These are the sexually confused people that don't know whether they're a man or a woman or they're engaged in homosexuality uh, or any other sexual perversion. And we call them the confused because confusion will cause you, these are deceptions that will cause you to follow a way that is not godly and that is not God's will. And you need to know the difference between the two. These things are not explained away psychologically or through family, whatever. These are sins that are in people's lives that need to be confronted. And I'm thrilled to see that we, we, we've had situations in this church where people have confronted that and they're fighting back. I, I'm so thankful for your prayers and we're seeing some successes in that area. But, you need to know the difference with the deadly confusions that we're going to confront in your life. <coughs> Today, I'm going to talk about something that is confused and conflicted in Christians' lives, and it's just this salvation. What is salvation? What, how are we saved? Who has saved us? There, there is confusion within churches of those two things. One of the first things that I begin to direct to concrements is, how are you saved? Are you saved? Do you know how? Do you know why? What's going on there? Because people have all kind of strange answers for salvation. We haven't gone to the Bible. We haven't looked to see what God says. So we have just adopted from our culture what salvation really means. We've allowed denominations. We've allowed church doctrines to tell us what salvation really was. Now, this is just one of the issues. I'm going to be dealing with several of them, but let's begin Let's go to Mark chapter 1, verse 15, as we begin to answer the question, because salvation is the most essential of all the essentials. You can know that you're saved. You can know why you are saved, and you can know who has saved you. The Bible says the time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I believe King James says the gospel, and that's what the good news is. It's the gospel. So we know that to be saved, we know that we need to repent, and we need to believe the good news. We need to believe what the Lord has said, not pick it apart, not decide what it really means, no, but to trust God to speak to our heart and tell us what the truth really says. So who has saved us? Let's go to the, to the next scripture in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That heart is that part of you, your soul, belief, 
Your soul already does trust God. Your soul already does want God. What we need to do is get out of the way of our own intellect, our own minds, and allow the soul to reach out to God. David said, my soul longs after you. As the deer looks for water, my soul wants you. Every person's soul needs and desires God. But if your intellect won't let that soul find God, you're in big, big trouble. You can actually get in your own way. And that's what happens with most people, is that they don't understand that in order for them to be fulfilled and truly happy and satisfied, they have to let their soul reach out and touch God. This is why when we worship and sing songs, what we're doing, we're not just sitting there mechanically singing a song, but our soul is longing to worship God. Look past everything and begin to think and to concentrate on the Lord when we go into singing songs because that's what we're doing. Our souls are lifting up their themselves to the Lord and touching God's heart. So how are we saved? Who has saved us? It has been Jesus Christ. And we repent and believe the good news. And then we confess, and then we believe that Jesus is who he said he was. I asked my dad a long time ago because our doctrine sometimes lifts up a wall to salvation. Sometimes we make salvation more difficult than it really is. Well, you've got to come here, you've got to go through this, and you've got to say this, and you've got to do this. But Scripture doesn't say a lot of that. Scripture says to believe with my heart and confess with my mouth, and I will be saved. Well, that's just too easy. we got to make this a little bit more difficult because in our intellect, we think, well, now that's not much of an accomplishment. But see, what God has done, he's made salvation so easy, so simple, that anybody in any condition can accept and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you've got a drug addict in the gutter and he's looking, he, he, he's looking for answers, it has to be easy. You can't say, well, here, you need to read this manual and then we need to present you before the board and then we need to approve you. you got to, no. No, what the kids did last week did not save them. But a lot of people think that is salvation. They believe that you got to do all those things, and once you do that, you're saved. I began telling them early on, this won't save you. Then I landed. I said, this will not save you. And then I told them what it takes to be saved. And then I began to ask them, are you saved? Why are you saved? How are you saved? That is so critical that we understand that salvation is very simple. My, my cousin, Marty, Marty Hall, he died uh, just a week and a half ago. And uh, Marty did not, he didn't meet my standard of what a good Christian man should be. He didn't attend church very well at all. Um, he, uh, I, you know, he just wasn't the kind of guy I would go and say, would you pray for me? And I was talking to Aunt Diane, his mom, and uh, this was, you know, shortly after his death. And Diane began to tell me what happened with Marty. Well, Marty had a, a sudden heart attack, and he died in the kitchen. He was there with her, and, um, and he began to have a heart attack. I said, Aunt Diane, because I could tell in her voice, I could tell she was very concerned. She was worried about Marty's eternity. And I know her background. I know the, the, the woman of God that she is. I know the expectations of what she has. I said, Aunt Diane, tell me about Marty. What was his spiritual experience? What did he have? She said, well, David, he, you know, he gave his heart to the Lord. I said, okay, that's really good. And she said, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I said, oh, that's really good, you know. And she says, but, and she began to tell me the failures and the things that he did that caused her to be so concerned about his security with the Lord. And she said, and he was in the kitchen, and he grabbed his heart, and he said, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And he walked around for a while in the kitchen, just sort of staggering around saying, oh God, and then he fell down, and she said, I don't know if he died there on the floor in the ambulance or at the hospital, but he didn't make it. I said, okay. Aunt Diane, I know what Marty knew. I know he watched your life and knew your life. I know that he had some powerful experiences with the Lord. Do you think it's possible 
even if he had strayed from God, that in some of those, oh God, because what I think, Rhonda, immediately is pain. Ouch. Oh, oh God. But he knew what to do. He knew what to say. And I told her, I said, I believe that Marty was crying out to God. God the deliverer. God the savior. God the provider. God the everything. The ancient of days. The self-existent one. I believe that he was calling out to God. And he wasn't an itinerant evangelist. He wasn't a pastor or a bishop. But Marty knew what to do. He knew what to say. And I want you to be at comfort and peace that you taught him well. You trained him well. You raised him as a child. And you experienced his experiences. You saw it happen in the church. Do you think it's possible? Do you think it's feasible at all that he may have been really calling out to the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and the God of Gods? And if he was, and I believe he very well may have been, do you think that God would be faithful and just to answer and to hear him and to touch his heart and to meet his need? Would he need to go through a process in your church or my church that where I was satisfied with him that he would be saved? No. The Lord is a breath away from you. He is just a whisper away from you. And he can touch you where you are, how you are, in any situation, as long as your heart cries out to him. Believe in the heart, confess with the mouth, and the Bible says you will be saved. Salvation is not as difficult as we make it. It is very, very simple, and God made it that simple so that it would be very easy for us to be restored, to be saved, and to be changed by his power. Confess and believe. That is what salvation is. It doesn't take a 12 or 13 year process for anyone to be saved. It happens in an instant. One of my good friends, an atheist, talked with him about the Lord many times. I think that was the basis of our friendship. I think that's what he liked about me, is that I would dare to talk to him about Jesus Christ because he was an atheist. And it was difficult talking to him about the Lord because all you ever got was rejection. One time I told him, I said, Tony, I think that your religion is a rejection of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He chuckled and said, yeah, you're, you're probably right. But that didn't stop or deter me from presenting the truth to Tony. And one of the things that I told Tony, I said, Tony, you don't need an A-frame church. You don't, even, you don't need that church by the veil. You don't need, you don't need any, any, anything else like that. All you need is you and the Lord and you talking to him and you being serious with him. You don't need me. You don't need anything else. All you need is to talk to the Lord because your soul wants to meet God. And if you will ever get out of that soul's way, Tony, the reason we're talking is because your soul likes what I'm saying. Your intellect doesn't, but your soul does. And I made it as simple as I possibly could for him. I said, if you ever want to talk and me to pray for you, give me a call. I'll be happy to do it. And there was a moment where I did pray with him later. But I said, all you need to do is call upon the name of the Lord and he will hear you and he will save you and he will deliver you out of whatever mess that you're in. Romans chapter 12, verses 10 through 12 through 14. Listen to what it says. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. No difference between Christian and atheist. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. One of the most effective things you could tell your, your, your friends and relatives who are lost is say, if you'll just call upon the name of the Lord, if you'll just humble yourself and say, God, help. Or you might even say, oh God, oh God. God wants to hear his people call for help. And if you'll only call upon his name, I promise you, Tony, that God will be there for you. He says, everyone who calls on the name will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? In other words, if you don't believe in the Lord, you're not going to call. But that call is evidence of faith. That is a marker that the Lord hears and says, you know what? He's calling me. He can't see me, he can't feel me, he can't hear me, he can't touch me, but he's calling on me, and that's his faith. And how can they believe the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Ken, what you did, brother, that's, that's ministry. You're preaching to that guy. 
You didn't have notes. You didn't have Bob. You didn't have a screen behind you. But brother, when you said, is there anything I could pray for you about? I'm a Christian. That's preaching. It's representing the Lord Jesus Christ to someone. You may be shocked that some of these people may be Christians. One of the people that Ron and I did that with, this young lady, she said, well, can I pray for you? We said, well, absolutely. Sometimes, and that's, that's, a, that's really wonderful when that happens. But very often, people need to hear someone take a stand for God and project the ministry to them of love and concern. And look, it's tough because you've got to get past that pride factor. You've got to get out of that comfort zone to represent God to people because it is strange and foreign to the world. They need a preacher. They need someone to take that, that, that cross and to, to, to represent the Lord for them. So, to be saved, we call upon the name of the Lord. Salvation does not come through the church. It does not come through the unity of the brethren, the Methodist organization, or the Assemblies of God, the Church of God, the Presbyterian. It does not come through the Lutherans. It does not come through any denomination. Salvation is not owned or managed by any group of men and women. It comes through the name of the Lord. It doesn't come through the pastor. It doesn't come through grandma. It doesn't come through any other situation or entity, but through Jesus Christ himself. So when asked, are you saved? I hope you will answer something like this. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that has saved me. It is his sacrifice on the cross, his atonement, the work that he did for me on the cross when he died for me, when I didn't know I needed anyone to die for me. When I was still in my sins, he had compassion upon me. And he looked down from the cross, and now he told those people, sent it to those people. But he was speaking to us in ages to come. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I don't understand that kind of love. I have very many times that I want to, I want to let people have it. I want to give them what they deserve. And every time I think that, God says, do you want me to give you what you deserve? And I say, no, Lord, I do not. And then he encourages me to hold my peace. It is important that you understand what salvation is, where it comes from, how to receive it. It is only by faith that you receive salvation. It's the reason we open this communion table to everyone. After, after we repent, after we forgive, we prepare our hearts to receive this table. The reason that we do that is because it is free to all. And we don't restrict anyone from receiving this table. You say, well, Brother Dave, what happens if a child comes up and that child doesn't understand or discern what's going on there? Well, then you know what happens to that innocent child? It becomes just bread and juice. That's all it is. And as a matter of fact, it's a little further than that because it's faith and trust in your leadership and faith and trust in God. The disciples didn't understand. It, at Passover, they didn't understand what was happening. They just obeyed what Moses said that God had told him. And they walked in obedience to the Lord. And everyone in the house participated. The men, the women, the children, the entire household partook of that Passover, which is what we call communion today. We don't restrict people from practicing their faith. I got in trouble with the denomination at the camp. I don't know if I've ever gone public with this. I got, in, I got in trouble doing the camps because while we were doing our camps on Thursday night, I was just preaching and I was speaking and we were ma making, you know, having a ministry time with the kids. And kids would begin to line up and say, I want to be baptized. And, and I wasn't preaching on baptism. I didn't say one thing about baptism any of those weeks. But children, these, these young people had a desire to do something that required faith. And I said, well, well, you know, the first kid, is, I said, well, what, why? What, what, what do you want? I began to get denominational about it. Stand with me, please. I'm almost done. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you. We remember you, God. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for your mercy that you have bestowed upon my life and the lives of these people. Father, we just want to thank you for being powerful. I thank you for being loving. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your salvation of which I have no hope without your involvement. I love you, Father, and I give you thanks today. I remember you today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. What we did in that moment, the Bible says now is the, now is the time.
Today is the day. So when someone comes to you and they want ministry, you're compelled to give it to them. Right there, right then. I asked the in person, I begin to quiz them. Like, what do, what do, what do you think baptism is? What, what is and, and, and I began to talk at them. They were compelled. There's a spiritual compulsion in them. I want to be baptized. And I began talking to them. So I, so I thought, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to say no. I'm not going to turn them away. Because in coming to me, they're coming to God's representative. So in essence, they're coming to God. God won't turn them away. So this human is not going to turn them away because of denominational rules or culture or heritage. So I said, okay. I didn't have a, didn't have a tank, didn't have a baptistry. I told one of, the, one of the leaders, I said, could you go get a couple pitchers of water? And they ran and they got a pitcher of water out of the kitchen. They came back and I baptized them. And then, and then another young person came up and I baptized them. And all I did was pour the water over them. I think you helped me treat Jesus. The, the pastor at, at Temple, he, he began to take it. And he said, man, he said, this is exciting. I've never done anything like this before. And the kids went back to their seats in that outdoor chapel, soaking wet. Because you know me, I didn't sprinkle on their face. I poured it over their head and just went everywhere. But I wanted them to have that experience. And I didn't want to be the person that turned them away because of denominational rules. And here's how I got in trouble. Word got back. The kids went back and said, I was baptized. I said, what? What? You were baptized? Where? At camp. Well, why did they do that? And then I began to hear it come through the grapevine. You know, the pastors were the ones that were disagreeing. They were saying, well, we didn't, we didn't have a moment. The family wasn't there. They didn't get to see it. Um, you know, and, and we missed that opportunity. The photo op was gone because Brother David ruined it. That was the reason. It's because it needs to be done here. You can't do it out there. We need to do it here. Do you know what can happen between that camp and there? Do you know the things that, that's why God said, he said, now is the time. Today is the day. We need to be willing and able to do what God said. Not modify it, not change it up, but let's do what he said. And sometimes some of these doctrines and rules can get in the way of what God has said. I can't tell you how many times I've come across things and said, well, that's not exactly what what God said, but, you know, to be peaceful with the denominational never, I need to be, I need to play ball. No longer. I'm going to do what God's called me to because the denomination hasn't called me into ministry. The Lord our God has called me into ministry. And I'm not going to let an ounce of time separate. Paul, you asked for us to pray for William's salvation and restoration to the Lord. Would it bother you if he got saved today and baptized and you didn't get, get there to go pin a flower on him? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I never. So would I, brother. So would I. See, it's not about us. It's about what he has said. And for us to avoid that confusion, we need to understand the salvation is not a photo op. It's not according to our heritage or our culture. It is a personal decision between a person and his or her God. That's it. Before the young people were examined by the elders, I said, right back over there. I told them, I said, this is a public profession of your faith. That's what confirmation is. It's when you publicly confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And they did that before they answered any questions. All three of them got up there. Before they started, they'd say something like this. I want to say my name is David Johnson, and I have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. He's changed my life. He's put in my heart, and I pledge to serve him for the rest of my life. They said something like that in their own words. And each time they said it, I could see in the elders, I could see an impact in them. Because of the boldness that it takes to do that. And before they spoke behind this pulpit last week, they again made a public profession of their faith in Jesus Christ. They were saying, in essence, this is who I am. This is why I'm here. This is why this is happening. Because Jesus has come into my heart and he's changed my life. When you make that kind of statement, there is no confusion whatsoever. Because there's one person, there's one way that you're saved, and it's through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Remember, it is the blood of Jesus that has saved you. It says, Jesus is the stone that you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The teenagers of the 70s, one way, one way. The hippies, that's what they were saying, one way. 
There's one way to God. It's not your pastor. It's not the Sunday school class. It's not the denomination. It's not your heritage. It's not your culture. It's Jesus Christ. And those people were baptized at the beach, which I'm sure disrupted a lot of denominational problems there, you know, or, or issues. At the beach, wherever we can find some water. When, when Philip baptized the eunuch, he said, where can we find water? There was water in a ditch. They stopped the carriage, stopped the chariot, went down into the ditch and baptized at that moment. Didn't wait. Didn't allow one minute to go under that first desire to be baptized or for God, have an experience with God. Know the difference. We need to testify of Jesus. We need to stop the confusion, and we need to distinguish between the common and the clean. You need to know yourself when it comes to salvation. Understand, He has saved you. It's only Him. And it is a decision that only you make. I told Aunt Diane about Marty. I said, Marty did not have to satisfy me. Marty didn't have to satisfy your church. And Marty didn't have to satisfy you. The only person that Marty needed to satisfy was Jesus Christ, his Savior. Isn't that a relief? Aren't you glad that your salvation doesn't, isn't based on an elder boy? Aren't you glad it isn't based on me? You better be. Aren't you glad it isn't based on any other organization or entity, but on Jesus Christ, our God that is full of grace and he's full of mercy and he's full of love towards you? I might say, well, you say you're saved, but I think you did that a little wrong. No, all you need to do is satisfy the Lord, Jesus Christ. If we are not willfully ignorant of God's ways, if we choose not to be willfully and comfortably ignorant of what God has said. You know what I'm telling you to do, Darcy? Get in this, know what it says, learn what it says, and walk in what it says. If we are not comfortably ignorant of God's ways, we will affect our environment and we will change the world. Back there on that back row, of that table, with his head down, is Ken. Ken's a world changer. Ken's willing to go into IHOP and not care what a man his same age thinks about him. Doesn't care. Because he was taking a stand for God, and he spoke the Lord into that man's ear. And Ken, it made you attractive. That's why he kept circling back around. Because something there attracted him. That boldness, that relationship you have with the Lord. He's probably wondering all his life, is this real? I've seen so many hypocrites and so many phonies. And then when a guy comes into his restaurant, and says that boldly to him, a complete stranger, that has an attraction. That's leadership. And, and the person responded to it, and the Lord touched his heart and his life. We're going to activate what we said today. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'd be remiss if I didn't say, if you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, not the unity of the brethren, not any table of brethren church, or not your church experience, but do you know the Lord? as your personal Savior? Have you asked Him to come into your heart and change your life? Have you confessed Him with your mouth? He is the Lord and Savior. He's the only hope in this universe. That is what salvation is. Trusting Him with your life and devoting yourself to Him. You, you created me. I am the work of your hands. So tell me what to do, O oh God. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. I trust you with my life. I repent of my sin. If you haven't gone in that detail, you can now. All you have to do is say, God, come into my life. Change me forever. I accept your work on the cross as an atonement for my sin. And the Bible tells us if you do that, he will come in and sup with you and you with him. He will, you, he will come into that door and he will speak with you and be your friend. Not an acquaintance. I believe in the good man upstairs. No, no, no. He's my friend. He's my Lord, my counselor, my Savior. If that's you today, I want you to pray with the rest of us. And we're about to pray together and mean it. This isn't some magic. If you mean what you're about to pray, if you're serious, I promise you the Lord will come into your heart and he will change your life. And your salvation will be as real as rain. 
So I want everyone in this room, this building, let's make it easy for everybody. I'm not going to have you stand up, come to the front, and stand alone in front of everybody. I want to make it simple for you because salvation is simple. So everyone repeat this prayer after me, especially those aren't sh- who aren't sure about their standing with God. Say, dear Lord, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I confess my sins and I profess with my mouth that you're the only hope for mankind. You alone hold salvation and my soul desires it. Come into my heart. Please forgive me my sin and change my life. I want to be useful for you and I want my life to mean something. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You did that. You mean that with all of your heart. Jesus Christ has come into your heart and into your life. You don't have to pay any money. You don't have to memorize scripture. You just have to mean it in your heart. That means that anywhere you are, wherever you are, if and well, when you say it, when you stumble, that same God that just forgave you will be there to respond to you saying, Forgive me, Lord. I don't want to disappoint you. Come into my heart and change my life. Stand with me, please, across this room. Brother Paul, if you would come. Lead us in our final song. The music fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all the guilty stains. Lose all the guilty stains. Lose all the guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that blood, lose all the guilty stains. Men, I want to apologize to you on behalf of clergy that have taught things that are wrong and have misrepresented salvation and what it really is. I accept that responsibility. That has been my camp that has done that by a great measure. And more of us need to come out and tell the truth. We'll be dealing with other issues in the church that people have misconstrued their ideas about what it is. And sometimes it's being led by members of the clergy. And we're going to be dealing with these things because there doesn't need to be any confusion in the camp because that can be very, very fatal. So I want to encourage you that. Also, next week, before I bless you, next week we're going to do a special. I'm, I'm going to interrupt this series, and we're going to, we're going to talk about children and the importance of salvation is at an early age. And we're going to have a special prayer time for these children that are about to flood into this building. We're going to pray that God will save many of these children and touch and change their lives. As a matter of fact, you're going to see pictures of me uh, when I was about seven or eight years old when I was saved. Rhonda, are you going to submit a picture? Maybe, yeah. And if you have pictures of when you were younger and that, that you were saved at that age, would you please send them to Diane? Diane, everybody knows Diane's number. You can just send her, send your picture if you have the courage to do that. I'd love to see some of you guys at, eight, two, at, eight, at age eight, right? <laughs> but, but we're going to do that next week. If you have some pictures you'd like to send of when you were saved, please send them to Diane, and we will we'll do that. Raise your right hands with me, please. This comes out of Exodus chapter 15 and 26, but I'm going to bless you with it. If you listen carefully to the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his eyes, If you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, the Lord God will not bring on you any of the diseases that he brought on the Egyptians, for he is the Lord, our God, who heals you in Jesus' name. Be blessed. Go with God. Have a great week. We have have food ministry in just a few moments. If you want to do something that's good and right, please help us. Uh, All we do is distribute, and then we come back to the car and we pray. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Amen.